This is the Hot Fish series from the University of Sterling. Hello and welcome to the Hot Fish podcast series where early career researchers at the Institute of Aquaculture in Stirling tell us something about their research and how it relates to climate change. Today I'm talking to Reid Osritich who specialises in a One Health approach to aquaculture in the context of a changing climate. He's been working on a Belmont NERT project in Brazil and Ivory Coast coordinated by Julio de Leo at Stanford University but working with local partners focusing on understanding the dynamics of snails as vectors of schistosomiasis. What, if any, is the role of farm fish in controlling them? Reed's been working in Ivory Coast with Professor Elisa Nagoran of UFHB in, in Abidjan. So, Reed, you know, we hear quite a lot about One Health-based approaches to solving complex problems these days, but can you briefly tell us what One Health really means? Thanks for having me, Dave. Um, so One Health is the concept that the health of humans, animals, and our environment are really influencing and influenced by one another. Um, and so a One Health-based approach to a problem, especially a complex problem, uh, recognizes this interdependability of, of these three um, factors. Uh, and so they, these factors need to be considered when developing a long-term solution. So because of this, uh, there needs to, uh, in, a, in a solution or problem-solving team, there needs to be involved uh, stakeholders, both from multiple fields and also with different life experiences, uh, to really formulate a, a, a dependable long-term solution. Hmm. Okay, it's interesting. I, I know waterborne diseases are generally a big problem in many parts of the world, but, but what, what is schistosomiasis and why is it considered a, a neglected disease of poverty? So schistosomiasis is a disease called by, caused by members of the uh, helminthic parasite genus uh, schistosoma, of which six species cause this disease in mammals. Um, there are over 200 million people right now are infected uh, with schistosomiasis. Most of them are in Africa. Um, what's particularly insidious about this disease is that after uh, it infects the host, the human host or animal host, uh, these worm-like parasites travel to either the bowel or the bladder region of the body and settle in the soft tissues there, sexually reproducing for years and years and producing thousands of eggs. Um, the symptoms, therefore, of the schistosoma producing these eggs uh, are, are caused by the body's immune response. And um, they can include uh, chronic fatigue, um, anywhere, anywhere from chronic fatigue to uh, bowel cancer and uh, left untreated, uh, also the, the death of the host. Um, because it's a waterborne illness, uh, those who are in regular contact with infested water bodies are particularly vulnerable and at risk to the disease. Um, and these include uh, women and young children, especially, who play around in the water. Um, however, uh, schistosomiasis, the schistosoma uh, uh, parasite requires an intermediate snail host to complete their life cycle. So if you don't have a snail host uh, in the water, then you don't have schistosomiasis infesting the water. Right. So schistosomiasis is a waterborne disease, but needs that intermediate snail host to infect humans and cattle. But aren't there molluscicides? You know, isn't there a sort of chemical approach to get rid of the snails uh, perhaps faster and more permanently than, than other measures? Um, there are. Uh, however, only one molluscicide has been approved by the UN for widespread use. And recent studies, uh, part, in part uh, by some of our, our Belmont partners in this uh, project, have shown um, that in particularly in Cote, Cote d'Ivoire and Kenya, where the studies have been, that the molluscicide is ineffective for sustained control of these snails uh, for various reasons, uh, ranging from just uh, uh, re the need for repeated applications of the, the molluscicide, which can be quite expensive, um, uh, inefficient or, or, or in inaccurate application, um, or just simply because the snails bounce back so quickly um, mm. in, in these environments. Wow, that's interesting. So, so there really, really is a real possibility that aquaculture has this sort of One Health-based role to play in controlling schistosomiasis in, in, in areas where it's endemic, such as Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Um, but how's the changing of climate affecting the sort of epidemiology in a place like Côte d'Ivoire? 
Right. So that, uh, as you say, um, aquaculture uh, uh, has a possibility to controlling this parasite by controlling the intermediate snail hosts. Uh, if you find a fish that really loves the snails and put them into a particular water body, they can uh, control the snail population long term and therefore uh, eliminate or at least greatly reduce schistosomiasis in that area. But the increasing water temperatures as a redirect, direct result of climate change is affecting the distribution of those host snails and as a result the distribution of the different types of schistosomiasis. Because the different snail species host different uh, schistosomiasis species, sh sorry, schistosome species, and therefore um, they also like different uh, uh, temperature envelopes and different um, environments, whether it's, it's uh, hiding under, under um, uh, floating uh, uh, water hyacinth or other greeneries um, such as that, or um, directly on the bottom or sides of, of a lake or, or channel. Um, the measures African countries are taking to adapt to changes in climate-driven fluctuations in water availability and in storm intensity are also um, a big factor in this because the installation of dams in particular, uh, which the ones that which retrain water for the increasing the arability of land um, throughout the year and, and over the landscape, have been proven drivers of big increases in local endemicity rates for schistosomiasis, both during and after the completion of these dams, um, during construction after completion, uh, due to uh, both migratory labor, uh, bringing the disease into a community that was formerly untouched, or just the uh, great expansion of the suitable snail habitat uh, via the expansion of the arable land. So yeah, it's really complicated, isn't it? This this sort of change in a water body that, you know, it's it's like a one of those outcomes that's perhaps not fully worked into to measures such as improving irrigation is this actual increase in in public health historically uh, yes. problems yeah exactly so so maybe fish farming can be used to to grow fish that eat the the host snails and i'm, I'm guessing not all fish are equal in this respect and some fish are much better at con controlling snails because they they like eating them but but what about the dangers of in introducing non-native species into african water boys i'm sure that's happened before hasn't it uh, yes, and uh, not necessarily for the uh, direct control of of, parasit of, of the snails um, that that act as hosts, but yes, as as um, uh, some of us may have heard, the the uh, crayfish inv invasions in Kenya and Madagascar have been quite catastrophic for the the local ecosystems in those areas. But that's why we have a, a particular focus on using native uh, mollusciferous, the, the snail loving species, in this work. Um, they're often species that have suffered uh, local stock declines due to various factors. And the thought is that using fish farming to increase the numbers um, of these species, both in closed infested water bodies and also in the wild, will promote both a long-term local disease control of schistosomiasis and regional food security, um, particularly with the West African lungfish, as they are not targeted by fish, fishers directly, um, and they're quite easy to dig out of the mud by the riverbanks during periods of prolonged drought. Uh, by those who lack boats and other fishing equipment, and so um, in, in, in effect act as a famine food um, and provide a, a nutritional security for local communities um, around those fisheries. So a double, a double bonus, controlling a dis potentially a disease, but also making affordable food available locally. Yeah. That's hard to be, yeah. Yeah. So, so you're in the final year of this project, and what are your next steps in, the, in this research? So um, we have uh, one more session of fieldwork we're going to uh, conduct in the Ivory Coast uh, early next year um, to mainly con to conduct some drone surveys for uh, lungfish uh, habitat, um, trying to figure out where they are burrowed in the mud during the dry season there, and also to collect some stomach contents from the lungfish um, in the catchments near areas of high endemicity in, in communities uh, nearby. Uh, we also want to uh, finish an open access, uh, open access fish farming suitability tool, which is based on the latest climate models and is hosted on Google Earth Engine, or will be hosted there um, when it's released. And then um, I just need to write all of this research up um, and present these results uh, both at, at uh, international conferences, but also to the, the regional Ivorian authorities that we've met in previous uh, uh, sessions of fieldwork and through our local partners, uh, because they were, they were so helpful and instrumental in uh, gathering the initial information for this work, and uh, part of what, you know, what we personally want to do, and also uh, part of the remit for the project, is to communicate our findings um, back to the people who are most directly affected by them. 
So, as you say, the, the success of this type of field research is, is so dependent on on having good local partners, which we certainly do in Ivory Coast. So, so many thanks to, to them for supporting this work. Um, many thanks to our other partners on the, on the Belmont project. And it just leaves me to say uh, thank you and talk to you next time. Thank you. This podcast has been produced at the University of Stirling's Institute of Aquaculture with financial assistance from the Belmont Forum on Climate and Health. Thank you for listening.